Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Handwoven, Piecework, Spinoff, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. I'm your host, co founder Ann Merrow. This season is sponsored by Webs. Webs, America's yarn store, is your source for everything you need for your next weaving project. Webs carries a wide selection of yarns, looms, tools, and accessories, and you can save up to 25% every day with the Webs discount. Visit yarn.com for more info. Loran Gilbertson is the curator of the Vesterheim Museum in Decorah, Iowa. She has a particular passion for textiles, but her interests include the collection overall. We spoke with her about not only the Vesterheim's collection, but also about preservation and memory in general. So, Loran, tell me about your museum. Our museum uh, started way back in 1870. Uh, the first recorded donation was birds' eggs and birds' nests. And uh, from there, it grew as a college collection. I should mentioned that our collection began at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. And so the early years, it was the sort of thing you would find in maybe any college collection. It was uh, biological specimens. It was things brought back by missionaries from foreign countries. It was copies of classical artworks for the students to study. So it was a wide variety in the early years. But by 1895, the trustees had decided that a focus of the museum should be on Norwegian immigrant materials so that they could honor their immigrant parents. It was parents in those days. And so very early on, the collection began to focus on Norwegian immigrant material, uh, the material of Norwegians in America. Then we, well, I guess it was the 60s, we started to split from Luther College and then sent back the biological specimens and the uh, ethnographic materials and focused then as an independent museum on the Norwegian American materials and Norwegian materials. So the long story of our uh, collection, but it has early beginnings, but very early too in focusing on Norwegian American material. And, you know, being a textile person, I know most about the textile collection, but what sort of things do you have? We have definitely lots of textiles. We've thought that maybe uh, we have more textiles than anything else. If you start to call, count the individual items like each sock, or uh, each napkin out of a set. We have a lot of folk art, so things made in rural Norway and representing folk traditions of carving, metalworking. We have examples of silversmithing for jewelry. We have uh, folk costumes. We have uh, knitting and embroidery and all kinds of things. But we have also a lot of Norwegian American material, so things that represent life here for the immigrants. So tools, cooking equipment, household items, and more textiles that represent life in America. Do you know of other museums in the U.S. or elsewhere that have that sort of cultural focus? There are quite a few. There are a number of museums in the U.S. that have focused on the Americans with a certain ethnic background. And for whatever reason, Iowa has quite a few of these museums. There's a Czech and Slovak museum, a Danish museum. Uh, we have quite a few here, but there are other museums spread across the U.S. that have focused on a single immigrant or ethnic group. There is uh, another museum that does include Norwegian immigrants. That's the National Nordic Museum in Seattle in particular. And they also then have materials from the Swedish immigrants, Danish, Icelandic. And uh, a number of our museums are interested in the Sami people, the people who were indigenous to Norway, Sweden, Finland, and uh, parts of Russia. And since those folks lived across borders, they're represented in several museums in the U.S. Uh, we try, uh, the National Nordic does as well, and there's a number of Swedish museums in the U.S. too. So a uh, wonderful diversity of cultures represented in the U.S. in ethnic museums. And in many of those, you can find some wonderful textiles. So I think being a museum curator is kind of like being a yarn shop owner or a book editor in that it's something that people envision and, and have these ideas about what it must be like. So what is it like to be a museum curator? Well, it can be really wonderful. I love the variety each day that it might be working on an exhibition or a lecture 
or perhaps another way to share the collection. Um, Piecework is one of my favorite ways to share. It could also be answering questions from the public. We get lots of questions about what is this object? How do I care for it? We are also keeping an eye on our collection too. So that might mean pulling objects for an exhibit. It might mean that we are considering a new object into the collection and then seeing that through the process, getting it stored or displayed. So it's quite a wide variety of things related to the objects themselves. It, I love especially the research, the opportunities I get to research the pieces, how they were used, how they were made, who used them. But at its root, our deep purpose is in preserving and sharing. So how to best keep these as resources for the public and researchers and craftspeople, and then how to share. And so I know that there's a maybe a common perception that museums are trying to sort of uh, squirrel away things, that they're just in some dusty room uncared for, but it's definitely not true. And what we really want is to share the pieces, to share their stories, hopefully that they can uh, inform and inspire. And that's our deepest mission as a curator. So how do you decide what to take into the collection? We have people sometimes who call us and ask us if we will take something that they treasure from their family. And we're we're a media company, so I can't even imagine how that must be for you. And that's tough too. We want to save everything, frankly. So uh, most museums have some sort of policy or guidelines or description that they use to start. And in our case, it's that we're interested in things that were brought from Norway with the immigrants. And we're interested in things that were made or used here that would represent life uh, among the immigrants and for different generations, not just the ones who came, but then also Norwegian Americans. But that's a little bit on the vague side. So it is up to staff to make our best choices. One of the things that we consider is what kind of story can that object tell? Can we use it to tell stories of the decisions that immigrants made, what to take, what to leave behind? Can it tell us what life was like or what uh, people learned to do or how they adapted? Certainly, the stories by themselves are interesting, but when we can also connect the human stories with an object, I think it becomes even more meaningful. So one of the things we consider is what kind of stories can this tell? What can it enlighten about history? We consider whether we've got other examples, examples that are better, worse. How does that fit in? But it is really difficult because sometimes they're wonderful pieces. They're beautiful or they've got great history, but we've already got four or five. In the case of spinning wheels, I'll use that as an example. It seems that almost every female immigrant from a certain time period came with a spinning wheel. They had been accustomed to textile production in Norway and fully expected to do that here too. And so they brought a spinning wheel expecting to need to spin. Well, we have 80 spinning wheels. So when we're offered them today, it's hard to say no because each one's beautiful and it tells these important stories about textile production and uh, migration of skills. But there is a point at which we just have to stop and say we can't take any more And maybe we shouldn't even have all of the ones we do. But uh, that's definitely a consideration is can we care for this, preserve it, share its story, and so on. What's the range of spinning wheels that you have? Well, uh, most of ours are from probably the 1800s to the very early 1900s. And many of them are the uh, slanted table style. I'm not a spinner myself, so I'm maybe not using quite the right terms, but I think it's, is that the Saxony style it's often described as with the slanted table. We also have a number that are the double table style and just a few that are something else. I've been very interested in the history of technology, not only hand technology, but uh, factory technology. And so one of the spinning wheels that I particularly like is one that was factory made in Norway in a small community in Southern Norway. And this factory would uh, create the spinning wheels that then a Minnesota firm imported to make available to Norwegian immigrants and other Scandinavian immigrants who maybe hadn't brought one with them or theirs was no longer functional. And so I think it's very fascinating that the immigrants not only had brought a lot of these wheels, but were using them enough here that they needed more. 
And so this small community in southern Norway had originally had lots of woodworkers in their shop, or maybe it's a family making a certain style of wheel. But over time, then it became more of a mass production. And some of those ended up in the US. So again, more stories. Um, Interesting to think about what people wanted and needed and used here in America. One of the things that we see a lot in weaving is how many different weaving techniques come from Scandinavia. Some are Norwegian, some are Swedish. Tell me about your weaving collection. Oh, we have great examples of handwoven textiles. And again, there's both examples brought from Norway and examples made here. In Norway, weaving was really uh, a great art, but also a necessity. And so it would be very typical that a woman working in a farm home would be creating her bedding for her family, the clothing for her family. If the family was well off and they had servants, it was fairly typical that one of the conditions for your servants was that you provided a certain amount of fabric for them. And so women would be fairly active with textile production, linen, uh, wool in particular, and women were responsible for the sheep. So raising the sheep as well as shearing them, spinning them, and so on. And there are many beautiful examples of handwoven textiles. The ones that I think a lot of people are familiar with are the ones that would go on the beds, the coverlets. And these are colorful, there's wonderful patterns, and there's also a huge variety of weaving techniques from very finely patterned coverlets that are done in a technique called kruppragd, or bound weave, to the ones that have the very large geometric motifs, and to some that were woven with uh, short pieces of wool, or yarn, or even rabbit fur knotted in that could be used uh, as an extra warm bed covering. So I think what one, one of the things that's so wonderful about the Norwegian weaving tradition is it's so varied. And so people could become inspired by any number of aspects of this. It could be the weaving technique. It could be the patterns. Uh, and we see a lot of Norwegian Americans and other Americans taking inspiration and using some of these techniques, uh, moving the tradition forward, adapting the designs, doing some really wonderfully creative things. Say it again, Krukbrugd. Krukbrugd, K-R-O-K-B-R-A-G-D. And brugd, the word on the end, means weave or technique. And kruk stands for crooked path. It's often uh, translated as crooked path. So a lot of the motifs have little zigzags, um, little sort of even-sided crosses, little plus signs. And um, this is another example of how Americans and Norwegians today are expanding the technique. So the old coverlets have very densely patterned surfaces. They look very busy and uh, often you can stare at them for quite a while to kind of figure out what's really happening. It's so busy. But you can add space between those motifs. You can add more shots of a solid color. You can take each motif and make every part of it longer and slow it down and really enjoy the patterns. And it's so exciting for me to see the huge creativity out there and how artists have taken inspiration from any number of aspects of these, the colors, the patterns, and done some really amazing, amazing things. That's one of my joys as a curator, is seeing how these objects of the past can inspire artists today. There are so many words that I'm not sure if they're all Norwegian or, or some of them might be Swedish, but that I'm going to butcher. There's what you talked about with the knots. I would say mm -hmm. Raya. What's the... Mm -hmm. Ria is Ria. closer okay. to the Norwegian one. Ria, yeah. Ria. Um, there's what I would call Hofdral and Dukegang. Are those both Norwegian mm -hmm. as well? Uh, they are done in Norway. Some uh, Hofdral is a little bit more Swedish, but uh, a lot of these techniques are done across the borders. And that makes it fun too, I think, is that uh, some techniques are done in one part of Scandinavia, one is not, or they're done in both, but then there's some exciting differences and similarities to learn. Sorry for, for butchering that. Now, do you have a Norwegian background or how did you come to, to, to be able to say words like Ria? Uh, some of it is on the job training. A lot of the language skills uh, are things I picked up. I came to the job from a background of anthropology and textiles. And I started at Westerheim working just with the textiles. And then I've expanded in more recent years to work with all of the collection. But I think that 
maybe my anthropology background helped in lots of ways, not just because we are a cultural museum, but I think in that idea of wanting to understand what textiles and objects have meant to the people who've made and used them, that it's not just this was used, but trying to understand why, and that there's often meaning behind that too. Is it because this was a a well-seated cultural tradition? Is this because it was practical and new? What what is the story behind this? People don't just do things. They often do things with a reason. And so um, that's been something that I've really enjoyed getting to know. And a lot of this has been on the job. I wasn't very familiar with Norwegian textiles before I came to Vesterheim. So a lot of this has been learned here, both through um, kind of a more concentrated, deliberate study, and certainly trying to absorb as much as I could. I had the huge luxury of overlapping with my predecessor for 10 months. And that doesn't usually happen at jobs, but because our museum was getting ready to move the textile collection to a new storage facility, it made sense to have some extra help. So Lila Nelson, who was textile curator here before me for many years, stayed on and we worked together. And it was so wonderful because we would be uh, packing up objects and unpacking them. And as we would, she would just sort of talk about them. And she was already a teacher. She had been a teacher before she came into museum work, but she was a natural teacher too, that she just wanted to share these things. And I tried my best to absorb as much as I could and remember as much as I could. So that was a really, really wonderful opportunity for me to learn from her and to learn a lot more about the context for the objects and the techniques. And then since I've been here, I've tried to also learn more about the techniques I think that even if I'm never going to be a good weaver, I can learn a lot by trying to weave these techniques that you you learn a whole different perspective and appreciation for them when you really see what happens when you try to weave or when we know in terms of uh, technology that this particular weave is uh, complicated or is slow to set up to actually do it um, brings a whole new understanding. And so that's been an interest of mine as well as to at least sample some of these techniques to feel like I can really understand them. And you offer classes as well. We do. Vesterheim has been offering classes since the 60s. And it has been a wonderful addition because we can have the hands-on classes and offer experience with the collection too. So we try very often to offer classes that are some of the techniques or the objects from the collection, but then we bring the objects in and show the classes so that they can get a sense of their place in all of this. Plus they can take inspiration from the colors and patterns and so on. And um, I love to get to be the one to show the collections to the students and the instructor, because I learn a lot too, again, about technique or they're noticing other details or making comparisons to other cultural traditions. And so that's one of the great things about being a curator is there are opportunities every day to learn something new. And that's another great joy of this job. Now, because you collect things that came over and then were made, what kind of differences do you see between them? I would imagine that the materials must be different, but how have they changed over time? Definitely there's some differences in materials that in Norway at the time of mass immigration, starting in uh, the very first immigrant ship was 1825, but uh, we start to see increasing numbers at about the time of the U.S. Civil War. So when those Norwegians were leaving, the tradition in the countryside was really just primarily two fibers. It was wool and linen. And that they produced themselves. Many people had small plots of flax growing for linen. They raised sheep. And so one of the big differences is as they came here, they had a greater uh, access to other fibers, particularly cotton. So we see people weaving with a cotton warp and a wool weft. And yes, cotton came into Norway, but a little bit later and a little bit more slowly into the countryside. We see additions of color. So if we turn to embroidery, many people might be familiar with Hardanger embroidery the uh, cut work and drawn work embroidery with uh, geometric motifs very often. Here, uh, there were greater availabilities to fabrics and to embroidery threads. And so we see, instead of white on white only, we see yellow on white or 
uh, we see multiple colors on white and additions of other needlework trim, bobbin lace or crocheted lace edging. So we see materials definitely, we see some colors, we see some combinations. And then we see some clear departures where the immigrants or the Norwegian Americans in later generations have it's not that they've turned their back on the Norwegian traditions, it's they've more fully embraced the American styles. It was certainly a desire by many of the generations to be very American and to have American style clothing or American style bedding. So we see quilts adopted, but there's often these little overlaps and you are very intrigued by those. So the American stars on quilts, very popular motif, certainly similar to the eight petal flower motif that's traditional to Norway. And so um, it's wonderful to think about some possible connections and explore some of those possible connections of having something that looked both American and a little bit traditional to your homeland. Because I suppose you could bring flax seeds, and certainly we had flax seeds here, but people probably didn't bring their sheep, or did they bring their sheep? I don't know if they could, if they actually brought their sheep, but they often raised sheep. And some of the early immigrants were more likely to raise sheep than the later immigrants or the later generations. And I think this is just that uh, trend from self-sufficiency to a more broad market economy. But we do hear from diaries and letters of immigrants that maybe they kept a few sheep for fiber production, and you could certainly eat them too. That was very helpful. Uh, And then you would have a few horses and a few cows and a few pigs. And then later, as uh, farming has changed, people tended to shift more fully to one type of livestock. But in the very early years, it was quite common to have a sheep or two just for the fiber production. What was it like for people when they first came over? You mentioned that it was in the 1800s and then somewhat around the Civil War. Are most of the people that you are collecting from based near Decora, or is it all over the country? And what was life like for them when they came? We are a national museum, so we're interested in people who came to all over the United States. We tend to have the most material from Iowa and the Midwest, but we are definitely interested in the full range of immigrant stories. It depended on when you came and where. Uh, I can use just a few examples. This is from a family that came to Wisconsin, and uh, some people might have heard of the son of this couple, Torsten Veblen, who is a well-known economist. But his parents came first to uh, a part of Wisconsin, not far from Milwaukee. They had used most of their money for the voyage. And so they really didn't have much cash when they got here. And so it was a struggle to get started. Uh, I should go back and say that this was the the mid-1800s. And so they were trying to navigate a new language, new landscape, everything new. They didn't have a lot of cash. And they first settled in an area that was not particularly Scandinavian. And I think they had a little bit of trouble because there weren't some of those safety nets where maybe there would be people who had arrived earlier that could help you learn uh, how to manage and how to navigate life. And uh, so they had found themselves continuing to move further north and west in Wisconsin. They would buy up land, improve it, sell it, and keep going. And so finally, they ended up in an area with more Norwegian immigrants. And I think they stayed put a little bit better. But the Veblens did a lot of their own textile production. And luckily, we know a lot of details because of a son, Andrew, who um, later taught at Iowa State University. He was interested in his family's home culture and how that had translated in America. So he recorded all of her textile production. And we have detailed, detailed records uh, of how she she raised flax in the U.S., all the steps she took to prepare the flax. We also know that she helped out new arrivals from Norway by letting the families stay with them for a little while, maybe helping them find work, helping giving them textiles for clothing, and uh, a wonderful network of shared labor and of helping to ease the transition of immigrants. So in the Veblen's case, their very first years were a little bit challenging because so much of the money had been spent on the voyage. But as they um, found a place that was more comfortable to them, were starting to learn American farming and got to the point where they were able actually to help others. So in their case, things maybe uh, were a little rocky at first and became more easy. 
But I think the one thing is that uh, so many stories are so different that some people had challenges. Uh, there were many people who went back that something about life here was not to their liking and went back for good. And others had an easier time arriving and making do. So um, that's another fascination of the museum world is getting to learn the variety of these stories and uh, digging into a lot of the stories. Those records that Andrew Veblen made about his mother, Kari Veblen, are uh, preserved at the State Historical Society of Minnesota. So uh, we can look broadly across the U.S. for some of these stories. And um, we ask more questions now, too. I think that's another thing I'd like to note is that uh, regarding our collection, now when things come in, we ask lots more questions about what do the owners know about how they were used, who used them, the stories of their families. So hopefully we can have a, a more uh, rounded story about all our collections instead of just this came from Norway or this belonged to this person. It seems like the idea of provenance is such an important one when it comes to things like museums and archives. And just having a, a special or beautiful thing isn't really everything you need to know to have something in a collection. Right. You can definitely learn a lot from just the physical characteristics of an object. And we're also seeing a change, at least in our audiences, that maybe 40 years ago, the people that came to the museum would recognize these objects. Aha, I grew up with this, or I remember this from my grandmother's house. I know what this object is. But of course, time has gone by, uh, life has changed. And so now it's less about remembering and more about teaching. So teaching people, what is this object? How was it used? And that's where the provenance is so helpful because we can better put it into a context for people. We also know that people learn better if they're not just getting a few words about what this is, but we are explaining it through a person's story. So that's a shift a little bit in museum fields, but I think we've always known that the human story has been very powerful and we can better understand if we can put ourselves in their place. And by having a few uh, details about that person's life, we can do that a little more easily. So I have been fortunate enough to be in uh, among the collections at Vesterheim briefly. And one of the things that was just most eye-opening was the collection of beautiful garments, traditional clothing. And yeah, I'm sure that people had everyday things that, you know, wore out and they got rid of. But just the incredibly beautiful, embroidered, you know, embellished costumes and, and special occasion clothing. They're wonderful. There's so many details. And I guess that might be one of those things that we love about folk dress from any country is so many amazing details. The materials like ribbon or beads or embroidery, the textures of the fabrics themselves, and then, of course, the combination of all of these things together, along with jewelry or other accessories. It's so inspiring to see these details. And we are such a throwaway culture now that we would never put this much effort into something. Or we do, but it's for one day. It's for a wedding or it's for a special party. And then this item is never used again. And to think about these objects being used for many occasions, many celebrations and holidays, and being passed down. It's, it's such a rich cultural tradition. We don't have a lot of everyday garments, but those are fascinating as well, because you see what an important resource cloth was. And you see things with multiple patches and careful patches that you understand the amount of work that had gone into creating this, which meant it was worth the effort to use it longer. And we've lost a little bit of, a little bit of that now, but it's been fun to see the interest in mending, both mending for practical reasons and mending for decorative reasons. And um, I think as we ourselves are doing more creating of textiles, whether that's knitting or weaving or embroidery or sewing, or know people that do, I'm hoping we can... Uh, turn the corner a little bit and appreciate things a little bit more um, 
use them and enjoy them longer and uh, think more about what has gone into creating them, whether we created it or someone else did, or even if it's a manufactured item, someone still sewed those seams. Um, it was a machine, but the cloth was woven. Let's let's appreciate some of those things a little bit more. When you see a piece of folk dress, can you tell where it's from or something about its story just by looking at it? Sometimes. There are definitely some distinct differences, at least in Norwegian uh, folk dress, that would give you some hints sometimes as to what part of the country it came from. Uh, And that's what makes folk dress so wonderful, I think, global folk dress, is that there are these uh, regional differences, and you can get to know some of those and then really enjoy them and look for them. So in the case of Norwegian folk dress, sometimes it's the cut of the garment that gives you some clues. Very often it's the embroidery, if there's embroidery or other decorative details. Sometimes we really have to do a little bit of research, either through our own reference library or with our colleagues in Norway to pin some things down. And that's been another delight of this job, I think, is getting to know some of the scholars in Norway and craftspeople in Norway and to get to have a wonderful back and forth with them to learn about the pieces. They are just as interested to know what has ended up here as we are in understanding how these pieces came about or where they're from. So uh, there's this back to this learning opportunity idea again of learning about the pieces in our collection, but then also giving other scholars the opportunity to learn about them. What is the most recent thing that you've brought into your collection? Oh dear. Um, We accepted uh, something that was textile uh, even just a few weeks ago. We get offers almost every week of some kind of object, and we can't take it all, again, because sometimes we've got too many of them. Uh, Maybe the story isn't the best fit for us. I'll give you an example just from our department meeting this week where we considered some objects. We were offered a beautiful, fashionable, embroidered garment. But it turned out that the person who had worn it was not Norwegian American, so we weren't able to take it. It didn't fit our policy. But there have been lots of wonderful pieces offered. And so among those was a Norwegian national costume, so a folk-looking costume, but from the 20th century, that had been worn by a Norwegian American woman. She lived on the East Coast of the U.S. and was a regional style that we didn't already have represented. So... We don't have as many opportunities to display full uh, either folk dress from the past or folk costumes from the recent years, but uh, at least it'll be available for researchers and we can look for opportunities to share that. And what is the oldest object? You mentioned what had been, what was the first thing to be taken into the collection, but in terms of when it was created, what is the oldest, oldest item that you have? Well, our oldest item is not a textile. It is actually a Viking sword. And normally we would not have a Viking era sword, but it was transferred to our collection from a museum in Norway. And it was sent at a time that several Norwegian museums put together gifts to our museum for an anniversary of the first immigrant ship. The very first ship full of Norwegian immigrants came in 1825. And in about 1925, There were great celebrations in the U.S. in honor of this centennial, and Norwegian museums got together, put together a gift of several extras, and sent them here. And so the Viking sword that we have was sent as part of that gift of extras from Norwegian museums to celebrate 100 years of immigration to America. And our oldest textile, though... I think would probably be definitely 1600s. Um, I think we have a few fabric fragments with history that suggests that they are that old. And then we also have a couple woven tapestries that are um, either late 1600s, early 1700s. Um, Those are the ones that we're more sure about the date. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Viking item because the Westerheim has a surprising amount of information about warp-weighted weaving, which is a tongue twister, but also something that I, I'm noticing interest in here and there. And it, it is not at all what we think about in terms of Krukbrugt kruk and, and other contemporary weaving. So how did you get, how, how did you come to be a, a, a center for knowledge about 
warp weighted weaving? Oh, that's a great question. A lot of this had to do with a connection with one particular weaver in Norway. And her name is Marta Kleva Yule. She lives not far from the city of Bergen. And she had done a registration project near her home area. And they were discovering some coverlets that had a cord at the top. And you could think of it as a third selvage. So the point at which the yarns go around and continue and don't just end. So usually we see the selvages on the sides of weavings, but these coverlets had a third selvage in a sense at the top. And so she was researching these, she was registering them in this community, and they realized that there was quite a tradition of these and they had been woven on a warp weighted loom. And except for a few pockets in Norway, it really wasn't known that this technology continued past the very, very early days in Norway. So it was an exciting discovery for that community. And Marta has been working to share the stories about these holdovers of technology. There have been several different pockets and came to our museum. We have one or two of these came to study ours. We um, had her teach a class for Vesterheim visitors in Norway some years ago and just kept up this friendship and Uh, Americans have been fascinated to learn this because of the linkages with other cultures and with other times, like the Viking times. So uh, all of that came from a good friendship with Marta Kloviul in Norway. Marta has been also working with two other scholars, one in Iceland and one in Shetland, to understand the full uh, breadth of this tradition in the northern Atlantic countries. And you're one of the few places I've found that carries that book, that recent book about warp-weighted weaving as well. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful one because you get such a broad sense of the tradition. And uh, I think, again, one of, I keep saying, talking about all these great things about being a curator. One of Another great thing is uh, these opportunities to be presented with linkages through time and across cultures and through people. And it's so exciting to see and have the opportunity to be linked with this information and with people that you sometimes feel like you're the only one studying this topic, or you just don't know where you'll ever find the information. And suddenly these little linkages start up and you realize that the world isn't so big and scary. It's small, that there are people maybe not so far from you that have been researching this or trying this or know others. And it's great to very quickly get a sense of community and understanding about some of these older traditions and technologies. The first person I ever met who talked about it is Norman Kennedy, who is from Scotland and now lives in Vermont and just has such a passion for this. And I've been I've been hoping that I can go and and learn about it from him while he's while he's still teaching it, because I I think it's fairly uh, intensive. Absolutely. And and just because there's so much context and history behind some things that seem simple and that's where we can dip our toes in a little bit, maybe a class, or maybe we've read an article or a book, and then it leads to learning a little bit more and a little bit more, and then those ripples of knowledge that can go out. And um, I learned so much from the people who come and study our collection, that they're interested in knowing about our piece, but they come here with this vast knowledge and experience. So um, I try to use my very best uh, listening and absorbing skills to build this rich understanding of global textiles and global tradition. You mentioned a registration and a registering project. Can you tell me what that means? Sure. Um, I know that Norway does a lot of these, and certainly there are uh, projects in the U.S. Many people have heard about these projects through state quilt projects, but you look for opportunities to learn about and document things in private collections. And so perhaps you would put a call out for people to bring in a quilt that was made or used in your state. And you take a photograph, you find out what you can, record the dimensions, and then make that information available to researchers so that you don't ask people to give the objects. You want them to stay in families and be appreciated and enjoyed but you make the information about the pieces available to researchers more widely. Many states have done quilt registration projects, but in Norway, there have been a number of projects for uh, weaving techniques 
for, I know there was a big registration project in one part of Norway for knit and crocheted white bedspreads, which on one hand, that seems so almost ordinary in a sense, but some textile uh, enthusiasts realized that this was some information that might be lost about patterns and about uh, traditions again. And so they invited people to bring them in to photograph them and then make those photographs and document sheets available to researchers. That's so exciting. It's kind of a dispersed museum. Exactly. And I think that Uh, There would be ways to do more of this in the U.S., and we've certainly done a lot of this informally. So many people have been posting photos of their family pieces or something that maybe they found at an antiques show or an auction. And so we have that very informally, but there's a lot of searching that you have to do then for that technique. So if we can figure out where someone has done this project to record these, it can be a really wonderful resource. For people who approach the museum with an item that they want you to consider that doesn't meet your collection needs. What do you hope those people do with it or take home? I think I have, I I have an ulterior motive, which is that my mother who has a Swedish background is such a keeper and oh my gosh, the doilies, Uh, there are so many doilies. (laughs) And so, you know, I know that most of these are not really museum quality And over time, we know less and less about the people who made them. My mother knows some. I don't know as much. And I think that, you know, these things, they may not have a financial value or a museum or preservation value, but the work that goes into them feels like it should be, you know, respected and acknowledged. So what do you hope that people do or how do you hope that they think about the items that are not museum items? That's a great question. Sometimes it's as simple as finding another museum for them, but there are certainly lots of objects that maybe because they were so common that they either museums are full up or it doesn't quite fit collecting policies. I would hope that a lot of those stay in families or make their way to collectors or other enthusiasts. I'll maybe step up on my soapbox now. Um, I wish that people would share their family items, textiles included, on a regular basis. And I can understand that maybe your style isn't to have doilies all over the house, and that's okay. But I would hope that maybe on occasion, maybe it's Thanksgiving or um, your birthday, you might bring them out and talk about them hand them around, have everybody take a look. Maybe this is when you tell stories about a grandmother or a great aunt who was always making these or using these. Because if you hear the stories and see them and hear the appreciation for them and why, I think that later generations and not just younger generations, but also maybe um, kind of generations to the side will gain a better appreciation and will want them and will want to enjoy them or to save them or to share them further. I think the reason we are sometimes seeing today people who aren't interested in these items, and we certainly hear from people who come and offer things and say, well, but my family isn't interested in these. If I, if I give them to my kids, they'll throw them away. I think part of what has happened is that we've had this gap where the person who knows about these objects hasn't shared, maybe because they just assumed everybody knows or that everybody will appreciate that this is a family item. But I think unless you explain why and connect it with people and with stories and context, it can't really be appreciated. And that's what we're seeing is that uh, just knowing that something should be saved because it's old isn't quite a good enough reason or saving it because other generations have saved it. I think we need to get to know the people because if we, even if we had never met um, a great grandmother, if we know that she was the one who made this and that she lived in this state and this is the thing that brought her joy after her children had left home or that her eyesight failed and this was the one thing that she could do to keep her hands busy, whatever the story might be, I think if we can share this we will all appreciate objects better. And it gives our lives purpose too, to see our place in the bigger picture and in the world. So that would be my hope. Sorry, it's a long answer, is that we would be um, helping people connect to these objects. 
And it also goes with helping families understand their own history. And sometimes we have to get to a certain place on our own lives before we are really welcome, welcoming this kind of information. Sometimes that happens when our own children are a certain age or we get to a certain age and we start to think about our place in our family. And so for the people who say, oh, my kids won't want this or don't want this, I, I can't help but wonder if maybe they will, that they're just not quite at that right spot. But I think, too, it's not just about where you are in your own life. It's having learned these stories and connected to your past through the objects. They're powerful items. And so I hope we all take an opportunity, maybe at our next family gathering, whether that's virtual or in person, to share some of these objects and some of these stories so that the stories don't die and we can all gain a better appreciation for the objects. It's interesting as somebody who makes things by hand, having learned a little bit about stitching and weaving and spinning, I had no interest in the linens, for example, but embroidering a monogram, including some of them are very complicated, was just something that people did. And the skill involved with something that was just considered to be something everybody did. And as somebody who doesn't execute it at quite that level, I have so much more admiration. I I don't know that I still have a practical use for them, but I can certainly appreciate them more. Absolutely. There's so many details on old textiles that we wouldn't do, and maybe we don't know how to do, whether it is a little monogram, even just a small one, so that you know whose bed sheets they are and which sheets go back to which bed, or whether it's making a repair to something, or just a little hem stitching on something that would bring a little decoration, but bring a little joy. One of the things we love about Norwegian folk art is making useful things beautiful. And I I love that idea because even tools, so even textile tools of having a spinning wheel, but with your name painted on it, or having a um, another a, a weaving device that has carving on it, that the things that you use as tools, you use them every day, why shouldn't they be beautiful? You should be making things beautiful, but also enjoying the process. And one of those ways is having beautiful items. So I know some of us have done that with buying the um, knitting needles that are made out of the wood with the colorful patterning in it, or we've got uh, sewing boxes with beautiful decorations or uh, finding some other tool that's a little bit decorative too. And we maybe feel a little guilty at times, but we should not. Uh, The things we should do, even if the process brings us joy, why not make it even more joyful with something beautiful? How about using up and wearing out some of these items? So obviously a museum is a place where you want to keep things from being, you know, lost, but also worn through. How do you feel about the life cycle of some of these items that might not wind up in a museum? It's tough because we're missing a glimpse at a certain part of life, whether that's work or uh, home life. When things get used up, we don't know about them then. There's nothing that survives to help us understand. So on one hand, I don't like that things get used up. Uh, I wish that sometimes those everyday items or very worn items do end up being saved. But on the other hand, because of the amount of effort and energy in creating textiles from fabric and fiber to the finished item, whatever it is, um, it does seem like we should be using things thoroughly. And then maybe it goes on to its next life as a quilt or a rag rug or whatever it might be. So I guess I can see both sides to that. The museum person in me would say, don't send it on to its next life, whether that's a rag rug or the trash. Let's save it because it tells us about everyday life or about work. But then also too, I think, well, there's a resource there and we need to use that resource. So for people who are interested in seeing these collections that you're so passionate about, how do people come and experience what the Westerheim has to offer? Oh, great question. One way is to come and visit us. And that's not always possible, but um, Decora is a long way from a lot of people. So uh, that would be one way, though, is to come and visit us in person and see the pieces that are on exhibit. You could come and take a class, and then you would get to see some extra pieces. We do have a few items on our museum website. That's a great way in general sometimes to get to know a museum is to see what kind of collections are online. 
our textile collection only has uh, just a sampling, but still you can go to our virtual galleries and see a few sweaters and a few folk costumes and a few coverlets. And uh, another way would be to make an appointment and come and see us in person. It's helpful if you come with a research idea, maybe you're digging into a certain sewing technique, or you want to see things from a certain part of Norway, or maybe it's a family item that has ended up here. Uh, Just make an appointment ahead of time, and very often we're able to accommodate and give you a greater view. We do have a nice reference library. Right now that's available by appointment as well, but it may be that we have reference books that could help you. We have some great volumes from Norway to really expand things, and um, these... Uh, ideas work for other institutions as well, that increasingly museums are trying to share more collection online or via YouTube or uh, other opportunities virtually. And then there's very often an opportunity to make up an appointment um, and come and see things in person or see more things in person, I should say. We always have some things in the museum, but to see more things. Kate Larson refers to your textile collection as her, one of her favorite places on earth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, there's nothing like a a textile or museum collection. And if the museums near you are ever offering a behind the scenes visit day or a special program, I would encourage you to take advantage of it. Just getting a sense of how large the collections are, but also a sense of how well organized collections are so that you know that if you want to study Kruprog coverlets or if you want to understand warp weighted looms or whatever your passion is, I think having been in a textile collection or a museum collection gives you a sense of how possible it is to pursue your research interest because you can see that the shelves are numbered, that the objects are numbered, that they're grouped by type. And so um, I think until you really see that firsthand, you might think that it would be impossible to be able to research at a museum or to find certain things at a museum. But once you've been in once, you know that it's all possible. So a lot of things are closed now. And I understand that you folks are probably not at your full doors wide open capacity. But what is the next exhibit or project that you have coming up? Well, one of my next things is uh, not just for us, we're working on a traveling version of an exhibit that we did here a few years ago on tattoo traditions, both uh, global and ethnographic contemporary. So one of the things I'm doing right now is helping to get that onto the road. And looking ahead too, we've been talking about doing a mid-century textile exhibit. And so just seeing when that might be possible and how that might be possible. We don't have very many examples ourselves of mid-century Norwegian design in textile. So uh, there may be opportunities to borrow things from other institutions or individuals. So um, that is It's a little bit on the side, but that's something I've been thinking about. We did a mid-century enamel exhibit a few years ago, and that was such fun to connect with people of a variety of interests. Some of the people had received these items as wedding gifts back in the 50s and 60s. Other people were discovering this design right now and were truly passionate. And it was so much fun to have all of those people together and appreciating the same kind of object. So it'd be fun to do something like that with textiles, with weaving, with garments, printing. And so um, I'm hoping in the next few years, something like that might be possible here at the museum. Did you say tattoo as in a skin design? Exactly. Yeah. We are interested in how Norwegian traditions fit into more global perspectives. And so we were exploring the idea of a person communicating identity through tattoos. And we were working with a well-known anthropologist, Dr. Lars Krutak, in offering some context in history. And so certainly there were examples in the exhibit about global traditions, but also in Scandinavia. And one of the stories we were telling is about a Norwegian immigrant named Amund Dietzel, who was a sailor and learned to tattoo on ships and then eventually, when he ended up in Milwaukee, he owned, opened his own studio and was known as a pioneer in the American tattoo scene. Wow. I mean, I, th- I think about handwork, and that is certainly handwork, <laughs> just not with textiles. That's amazing. I will definitely keep an eye out for that. Well, Loran, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to exploring the collection more on online. And next time I'm in that part of the country, I will stop by again, although I will come prepared with what I would like to learn about. 
Well, I'm glad you got an introduction when you were here before, Anne, and you are very welcome back again. Thank you for talking with me today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.